Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to today's operational information update on the current wildfire situation in BC. For today's briefing, we'll have updates from Ian Meyer, Executive Director with the BC Wildfire Service. We'll also hear from Peter Brock, Executive Director of Regional Operations, Emergency Management BC, and Don Roberts, Spokesperson with BC RCMP. Should you have any questions for her, we also have on the line Dr. Sarah Henderson, Scientific Director in Environmental Health Services with the BC Centre for Disease Control. A reminder to media on the line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. Today, you will be limited to one question and one follow-up. With that, I'll turn it over to Ian Meyer, Executive Director with the BC Wildfire Service. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to give you an update. Uh, today, we're currently, BC Wildfire is currently uh, active, actioning 272 uh, wildfires in the province, 39 of which are wildfires of note. Uh, since April 1st, we've actioned 1,173 wildfires, resulting in 342,860 hectares of area burned. Over the last few days, we have extremely dry conditions for the southern half of the province, and, and we see no relief in sight uh, when it comes to uh, the southern part of the province. The north half of the province has received some cooler temperatures and, and higher uh, uh precipitation amounts. So that's helped us uh, reallocate some resources into the south. Um, as for over the next few days, we do anticipate uh, more resources coming into the province. We currently have 3,193 personnel engaged in the response activities throughout BC. Uh, that includes more than 1,100 contractors and, and 178 aircraft. Uh, tomorrow we do see, we'll see 112 Quebec personnel coming into the province. Uh, and then on Sunday, we'll see another 100 Mexican firefighters coming into the province uh, are due to arrive into Abbotsford. We've been lucky enough to secure uh, military uh, personnel. They are now in province uh, staging uh, out of Vernon, and we are currently um, briefing with uh, the military right as we speak. Uh, we also continue to work with uh, Australia to try and secure resources. We're, we are making progress on that uh, and hope to have uh, secured some numbers in the coming days. And with that, I'll hand it over to Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, it is now over to Peter Brock, Executive Director of Regional Operations with Emergency Management BC. Yeah, good afternoon. So I'm going to provide some messaging on evacuation orders and alerts and uh, some messaging regarding donations. Uh, so currently we have 25 states of local emergencies uh, involved in British Columbia and eight band council resolutions. Uh, so far, 50 evacuation orders have occurred, and that's uh, another six from yesterday and I believe three last night. And that equates to about 4,300 properties on evacuation order in BC at this time. We have 79 evacuation alerts, and that's another five since yesterday or an additional five since yesterday, and almost 18,000 properties on alert at this time. Uh, we have 18 reception centers stood up across BC that are listed on our Emergency Info BC website. And if you require supports or emergency supports as an evacuee, uh, please visit reception center in person or call our Emergency Support Services Info line at 1-800-585-9559. Uh, we also have information on how to register uh, once you get to a reception center and in order to receive supports you must show up in person. Just a little bit of messaging on donations. Uh, really appreciate the generosity in BC for a tremendous outpouring of donations. Just want to uh, drive the message home cash is the most effective way to help those affected by wildfires. Uh, donating items like clothing or furniture uh, creates a lot of logistical challenges for everyone involved in including the communities that have either lost homes or um, are evacuated. So the need for physical donations has uh, been met at this point, and we really urge everyone, if they're uh, interested in donating, 
to donate to the Red Cross British Columbia Fires Appeals Fund. And that can be uh, done in several ways, either online or by calling toll free 1-800-418-1111. So that's all I have for my update and happy to take questions. Thank you. Now we turn it over to Don Roberts, spokesperson with BCRCMP. Good afternoon. Uh, we just wanted to advise that we are going to continue to see an increase in RCMP officers throughout parts of British Columbia. Additional resources are currently being deployed again to the Central Interior and the Okanagan. So these resources are being moved in so they can respond as and where necessary and as quickly as possible to some of the evacuation alerts and orders that are taking place. An example last night, we did have members from uh, that were located in the 100 mile house area that were actually called in to assist with an evacuation order within the uh, area of Clinton RCMP's jurisdiction. So as these new alerts and orders come in, we are quickly assessing the impact and then also working very closely with uh, local uh, search and rescue personnel, as well as uh, BC conservation officers in order to do those door to door notifications. Um, we've been asked and we note that uh, there is a number of areas that some of these evacuation orders have been taking place throughout the week that are over some very wide geographic areas, but maybe there's limited number of homes or vacation properties in those areas. So what we do is the neighboring detachments are actually looking at that, working together to dis assess the best way to get to these locations. And then we also want to ensure that every single property is physically uh, attended to and notified. So uh, Vernon North Okanagan RCMP, as well as the BC uh, Highway Patrol Falkland were involved uh, last night in the White Rock Lake uh, order expansion that occurred. So uh, we're also conducting roving patrols uh, and, and during the day and night. And to date, there have been no issues or concerns raised with respect to any kind of uh, property crime or, or issues with regards to individuals trying to uh, not respect or attempt to violate the area restrictions. Um, just in the last few days alone, though, our patrols have actually been uh, there and been able to see and spot new fire starts and flares. And so they themselves have been calling those in as well. And the BC Wildfire Service has done an exceptional job at sort of hitting those new locations as they come up. So it's just another example of the, uh, the importance of reporting fire activity as soon and uh, as you see it. And uh, so the RCMP would like to remind everyone that to uh, dial uh, star 5555 if you see any uh, recent or new fire activity. And I'll be available for questions. Thank you very much. That concludes the operational updates for today. A reminder as well, we do have Dr. Sarah Henderson on the line to answer questions in addition to the people who have spoken. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. And a reminder as well to media, please take yourselves off speakerphone or Bluetooth if you're asking a question. For our first question, we go to Zara Premji, CVC. Question. Um, I just want to see if there's uh, anyone who can kind of explain what is going to be done perhaps differently than has been done in previous years to prepare for what we're hearing is going to be quite an awful wildfire season continuing, as we've heard over and over again next week, next month, expecting it to get worse and worse. Is there any new approach to how to uh, keep people safe and maintain safety, keep the tourism kind of still going, but uh, maintaining everything that we still need to go through at this point? Hi, Peter Brock with Emergency Management BC. Thanks for the question. Uh, just want to mention that each hazard that we deal with or every fire season that we experience, uh, we certainly take lessons learned from, from each season. Um, so for this one in particular, I think based on some of the weather events we've uh, heard about or experienced, uh, it's uh, obviously uh, really critical that we look at uh, improving anything we can moving forward. Um, some of the pieces that we've uh, heard a lot of feedback on and are actively looking at um, pursuing working and working towards is um, looking at how we're alerting uh, the public um, uh, during fires and looking at uh, how we can improve that process going forward. I could also. Sarah, do you have a follow up? You can go ahead, Ian. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we can. A couple things that uh, we're really focusing on, and if everyone can. Uh, do their part with personal preparedness, uh, keep, uh, use our uh, uh, wildfire app to keep their situational awareness up. Uh, and we are really emphasizing open communication. So 
Uh, people are, are aware of what's going on in the land base. The, the challenges we're seeing, uh, then it, you can start to better prepare yourself to get your family and, and your uh, self in a, in a place that uh, is safe. Uh, that's the biggest thing we can do in the short term for this season. And then tag into what Pater said is we do do a lot of um, uh, reviewing and learning from past practices and past fire season uh, to continue to get better. And our, our, the partnerships we're forging with uh, local communities, First Nations, uh, the forest industry and, and ranching uh, are really starting to pay off. Uh, so we, we will continue to build those relationships and, and work together in, in dealing with these types of fire seasons into the future. Sarah, do you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you for those answers. And yes, one, uh, just wondering what sort of information perhaps, uh, I don't know, maybe Ian disclosed to you, what kind of information we can get uh, as far as the latest updates on what's happening at Spence's Bridge area, as well as around the 100-mile house area. Uh, as you can appreciate, the, those, uh, the situation on the ground is evolving very quickly. So what I can do is uh, get you in connection with uh, the regional uh, media people to get in our regional center to get more up-to-date information than I currently have. Thank For you. The next question. Thank you, Zara. For the next question, we'll go over to Mike Hager with the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead, Mike. Thanks for holding this update. Uh, I'm just wondering if anything has changed with res with regards to the alert ready system. Um, a colleague found that BC's never used it, and uh, that's in contrast to other provinces. Has the NBC um, changed anything given its real reticence to, to use such a, a powerful system? Yeah, Peter Brock, EMBC. Um, so we, we know that minutes count and we're certainly committed to making the alert ready system a priority. Um, as some know, we currently use alert ready for other hazards right now in BC, uh, such as tsunami alerting and Amber alert and civil disturbance, uh, hazards. Uh, and so the, um, uh, emphasis going forward is to make it a priority and we're currently and the examining how we can, uh, utilize alert ready for, for additional hazards, uh, beyond what we're currently doing. Uh, just want to put some emphasis on uh, right now, uh, we, we recognize uh, that Alert Ready would complement some of the many um, uh, uh, tools that are available to local communities and um, the public when it comes to evacuation. And so uh, we see Alert Ready as a, as a priority. Uh, we want to convey that we're going to make it a priority. Uh, and also mentioned that uh, for communities that currently have systems in place for alerting uh, residents for evacuation, that uh, it would certainly complement and augment, uh, but uh, not replace. So um, thank you. And do you have a follow-up, Mike? Yes, yeah, so it's a priority, but will it be in place in time to help out this wildfire season? And uh, why wasn't it implemented during the heat wave, uh, the heat dome that, that actually uh, led to many more sudden deaths? Was that not a severe enough emergency for it to be implemented? Uh, on that question, I'd say all emergencies are, are severe enough to really give um, consideration to the alert ready system. And uh, it would be too soon to provide any timelines on what we're looking at doing for alert ready. Um, just want to uh, reiterate that um, Alert Ready is a system that can be used for uh, many types of hazards, uh, including the ones you listed, and we're, um, we're we're prioritizing that going forward. For the next question, we go to Lisa Yuzda, News 1130. Hi there. I'm wondering what the biggest concern is right now. You know, we I see the fire. You know, there's wildfires burning. We just got the notices about drought levels in the southern half of the province and on the islands. Um, I'm just wondering what the biggest concern is right now, what the message is to people who are traveling around BC trying, you know, to do some tourism at the end of the pandemic, but also, you know, factor in these, these emergencies. Yeah, I'll just start the um, real message that we want to uh, 
bring home to everyone or, or convey is that it's really important to follow your local um, local authority or the destination that you are traveling in. Just uh, keep on their um, so either social media websites or some of the uh, website that they provide information updates on uh, to really know before you go on what's happening in BC and how that can support your, your travel plans. Um, the other piece I'd like to convey is um, really want uh, those that are on the road and traveling to uh, pay attention to local community evacuation orders and alerts and heed those warnings and uh, follow them to the T. Um, the last briefing I put emphasis uh, among my other colleagues on the importance to uh, recognize that an evacuation order means you are in danger and you need to leave the area immediately. And for evacuation alerts, um, that means you need to be prepared to leave very quickly. Um, so I think it's about staying in tune with your surroundings and keeping a high level of situational awareness. Thank you. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? And I'm wondering if you could give me an overview of which fires are the most concerning in the province right now. I would say all of our fires of note are concerning at this time. We, with the uh, resourcing that we have uh, and the, the fires on the land base that we have, uh, there's, uh, there's numerous fires that are uh, of great concern to us uh, and especially how the conditions are changing um, with the, uh, the, as the weather systems come through, like we saw in the last couple of days with wind, uh, the the, the situ fire situation changes rather quickly. That's why uh, connecting to what Peter said is planning and, and keeping your situational awareness uh, up is really key. For the next question, we go to Ben Milger, CTV. Uh, thank you. My first question is for Peter Brock with Emergency Management. Um, obviously, this time of year, a lot of people have vacations planned. I, I know that's not the priority for emergency responders, but when those people find themselves near wildfires or close to evacuation zones, uh, obviously that's uh, not good. Uh, what is the message to people who may, for instance, uh, have something booked in a Soyuz this weekend? Should they be canceling those plans? Uh, should tourists be avoiding areas uh, where there is increased wildfire activity. Yeah, my, my message would be um, if you have travel plans, uh, for the example you raise, um, really get onto the local authority's website or uh, identify how the local authority is conveying their messages as in regards to evacuation alerts and orders. And uh, my message would be uh, those are the things to watch and those things change very rapidly. So it's really important that uh, just checking prior to leaving and then finding yourself in a community doesn't mean that you um, don't need to check again. So uh, just a real strong message is uh, keep an eye out for changing conditions and those things can be changing even while we're doing this interview. So I uh, really recommend people stay in tune with uh, local authority and communities messaging on um, evacuation alerts and evacuation orders. Thank you. Ben, do you have a follow-up? Uh, I do. Also, for Peter, um, uh, there are 18 reception centers set up. Uh, can you give us some idea of uh, what the demand level is at those locations in terms of people arriving that, that haven't made arrangements with family and friends? Uh, and are there uh, some of those reception centers that uh, people should avoid because resources are taxed and, and ones that they should maybe uh, flow towards? Yeah. I for the reception centers themselves, uh, because it ebbs and flows and the volume can change day to day and either even during the day, um, I, I, it would be uh, uh, probably not productive for me to convey uh, which ones are, are, are busy and which ones are not because that can change very rapidly. Um, what I do want to really message is that for those that are um, uh, going to reception, travel, uh, reception centers to uh, receive supports, uh, that it's really important if they can to focus on staying with family and friends and that is to try to reduce some of the uh, accommodation challenges that we're having in bc thank you for the next question we'll go to lisa cordasco vancouver sun thank you my question is for the rcmp spokesperson what can you tell us about the level of theft breaking enters and any looting going on in the evacuation areas and what resources are devoted to this? 
We've actually had no reports or examples or come across any examples of any kind of property theft or um, issues with regards to uh, theft or theft over or property issues in any of the areas that have been subject to evacuation orders or alerts at this time. So we're very mindful to it. We are doing 24 seven our patrols with regards to those areas. We have the additional resources in place as well as working at the various checkpoints and road closures to monitor. But uh, we know how important it is for people to be able to leave their properties, particularly when there's an evacuation order in place. And we are remaining in those areas and will continue to ensure that everything is safe and secure when you're not there. Lisa, do you have a follow up? Yes, thank you for that answer. I'd like to follow up on a question asked previously by the Globe and Mail. Was any consideration given to using the alert ready uh, system during the heat dome? And why was that option rejected? The, the alert ready system is uh, always a system that can be looked at for a variety of hazards. Uh, we have to make sure that we get it right when we utilize alert ready and make sure that it complements and augments and doesn't uh, cross wires with some of the current um, alerting systems that are out there. Um, I, what's I really want to make uh, or put some emphasis on for, for the, all the talk on alert ready is uh, we see it as a priority and we see it as being a, a very effective system for additional hazards, um, but we also want to make sure that we get it right and we review uh, some of the pieces that uh, are, are currently utilized for alerting in BC and when we do land it, uh, land it right and um, make sure that it can provide service to British Columbians. For the next question, we go to Colton Davies, Radio NL. We were told a provincial state of emergency would help governments move quickly to set up lodging for evacuees. We're two days into this. All of Spence's Bridge was evacuated today and told to go to Chilliwack Secondary School if they can't stay with family or friends. That's almost three hours away with the Fraser Canyon Highway closed south of the town. Why has nothing been set up closer for those people? Yeah, right now, because of the current uh, situation in BC with the number of fires we have on the go, um, I, I want to message that we recognize and understand that some of the distances that's required are for travelers uh, or for those that have evacuated, uh, it's longer than what would normally uh, be something that we've experienced. Uh, this unprecedented uh, fire season has certainly created challenges with evacuees and challenges in finding places to stay and accommodations to, to, to stay at. And so we just ask that uh, um, communities uh, continue to do everything they can to support evacuees with the knowledge that uh, right now, based on the number of fires in BC, uh, we're doing the best we can to find accommodations for evacuees. Colton, do you have a follow-up? Yes, and thank you for that answer. So uh, really nothing's been done to set up, uh, you know, group lodging in the Kamloops area, like we saw in 2017, you know, very quickly after evacuation started. How much of a difference would that make? And, um, you know, officials like yourself have repeated over and over for people to follow evacuation orders. And uh, when people are worried about losing their home and are on order, the last place they ever want to be is hours away from home. So do you think you'd also get better buy-in on evacuation orders if, you were able to tell people that they could stay somewhere reasonably close by instead. Yeah, we, we really want to reiterate the message of uh, for evacuees, if they can make arrangements to first stay with friends and families, that will reduce the burden for those that have no other option. And it is very important that we identify space for evacuees. Uh, I know there is plans in place to set up group lodging um, in some of the areas that you'd mentioned. And those efforts continue, and we're working uh, around the clock to uh, try to bring in what we can to uh, support evacuation uh, areas uh, and uh, places for residents or evacuees to go to. For the next question, we go to Amy Smart, the Canadian Press. Hi there. I just have a question, I guess, about weather conditions. Um, there was the 48-hour wind warning issued on Tuesday. I'm curious to hear if it's had as bad of an effect as you expected, it obviously has had an effect. 
Um, and also with the um, drought conditions, whether water shortages are affecting firefighter efforts at all. Yeah, the, uh, the, the wind conditions that we had forecasted for the uh, last 48 hours uh, did uh, materialize as forecasted. Uh, they have uh, impacted the fires. Uh, and and it's, it's interesting to really look at how wind impacts each fire, dep uh, depending on the topography and, and where it's, uh, these fires are situated. Uh, we have seen some significant growth on, on most of our fires of note. Um, we are, what has ha also happened is created very smoky conditions uh, on a lot of those fires as well. So getting in and, and being able to uh, assess the true nature of that growth is, is what we're doing right now and, and making sure that uh, we readjust our, our plans accordingly. Uh, the water shortage, yes, is starting to, uh, we are seeing uh, the drought conditions impact uh, water. Uh, it's not impacting our firefighting efforts at this time. Uh, we, we are able to move water effectively um, with our either pumping systems or our uh, um, aviation resources. So we're not seeing an impact to uh, the firefighting efforts uh, yet. We have a follow-up, Amy. Um, yes, I actually have a question for Dr. Sarah Henderson. Um, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment has issued a, a report on uh, saying there's limited studies on the long-term impacts of exposure. Most of the public health is based on short-term, you know, a week of exposure, smoke exposure. I'm wondering if you can speak to whether you have any concerns about kind of the cumulative impacts of these, you know, successive fire seasons. You're quite right. There is very limited research on the longer term impacts of wildfire smoke. And we're certainly seeing conditions across Western North America where we are seeing populations exposed almost year after year. We will know more in the future. The key thing I like to tell people is if you protect yourself in the short term from smoke, you're also protecting yourself from any potential long term impacts as well. So it's, you know, smoke does affect human health and all the steps that you can take to reduce your exposure will help to protect your health. We have time for one more question. We will go to Mary Brooks of Island Social Trends. Mary, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. This question is for Ian Meyer with the BC Wildfire Service. I'm just wondering how many military personnel have been brought in and what they will be assigned to. And my context for that question is that last year, apparently the military people were only able to work on administrative duty. They didn't have the frontline skills that were needed. And that Premier Horgan has um, mentioned that uh, to the Prime Minister, and apparently there was agreement that more training would be done. So I'm just wondering if that training has been done in time for this year. And so that goes loops back to the original question, what are these military personnel actually working on? Thanks for the question. Uh, we Right now we have uh, approximately 250 military uh, personnel coming into the province. Uh, they, the intent is for them to be assigned to uh, the fire line. Uh, they have been trained uh, to do fire line work uh, and uh, the military has done a great job in working with us to increase that level of training and uh, over time, we'll continue to work with the military to continue to increase that level. Uh, so the, the intent is for them to get onto the line over the next couple of days. Mary, do you have a follow-up? Yes. yes, please. Um, this one is for Sarah Henderson, CDC. Um, I'm just wondering if the CDC might be, on your recommendation, um, speaking to municipalities, recommending to them that ventilation and air filtration for both heat and smoke uh, be undertaken fairly quickly since the heat emergencies seem to be upon us. Is that, uh, is that something that can be orchestrated for this year or next year? 
The BCCDC has developed resources for municipalities, particularly around heat and some around smoke. And we do highly encourage the regional health authorities to work with your, the municipalities to enact those plans. Unfortunately, some of these things take quite a lot of planning and can take quite a lot of time. Well, uh, what we hope is that, you know, as we move into the future, we are going to have uh, better and better plans for these types of events. Thank you for listening today, and thank you for supporting us with our sponsors. Please go to depictions.media for more information, and click on our contact link and let us know how we can help, how we can help bring your story and help bring us to a better world. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.